of Cavs Nation. I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. It's a solo dolo episode of the pod. Chris is getting a much needed day off. Jimmy Watkins as well. But I'm going to hold it down because we still got a game to recap and talk about. And there's a lot of different things to go into. But let's start here. The Cleveland Cavaliers have improved to 16-1. and Bouncing back from their first loss of the season on Tuesday with a 128-100 win against the New Orleans Pelicans on Wednesday. This was their 17th game in 29 days, a grueling stretch that has seen the Cavs play more basketball than nearly every team in the NBA. But when it comes to where this game was won, where this game was lost, it starts where the teams began the game. They came in with a lot of different injuries to both teams. The New Orleans Pelicans, eight of their nine Top scorers were out for the game. And then you talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers having most of their depth, their wing depth especially, and their defensive prowess out outside of the Twin Towers, of course. Darius Garland, Carol Zavert, Sam, Sam Merrill, Isaac Okoro, Dean Wade, Max Struess, Imani Bates, all out for the Cavs. And it was a game where you got to see how this team would uh, mature and show itself in adversity without some of these top tier guys, obviously Darius Garland is a big blow to that starting lineup, but it feels like this Cavs team is going to be able to put together a rewarding performance, a performance that shows who they are, even when other players are out. It's been a different way that they've won each and every game this season. Um, And again, it's a trend that has continued where this is another game where a different player was the leading scorer for the Cavs. And I want to get into him a little bit more in detail later on, but Ty Jerome has been on a tear, and there are some conversations that we need to have about how good he's been playing and how good he has been impacting this team as well. But I want to start from the very beginning, right? We came in understanding that this Cavs team was going to be hampered. The New Orleans Pelicans as well might have even been considered to have a shorter stick when it comes to uh, tonight's game, obviously with eight of their nine uh, top scorers out of the game. But when you come in and you say, hey, your point guard is going to be out um, and you're going to need to sub in, where do you go? Kenny Atkinson talked after the game about how the decision was made to give rookie forward his first start of the of the year uh, and first start of his career Jalen Tyson so Jalen Tyson was put into the starting lineup not because of Kenny Atkinson's immediate decision but because the assistant coaches and especially Damari Carroll in a conversation that they had in the elevator on the way to the game put him into the starting lineup and the rookie performed and we're going to get into that but I want to tell more of the story of how this happened we talked to JT after the game and how he kind of found out as he was arriving to the arena, he didn't know until he got there for the game that he was going to be starting. And that's something that's new. Obviously it's different. Usually, you know, what's going to be happening, but he didn't necessarily say that there were jitters until after he got his first bucket on a tip in, uh, in the first couple minutes of the game. And it kind of, he said it relieved the jitters that he had going in. And obviously you talk about how a rookie in today's era is being looked at. Obviously the 20th overall pick is a little bit different, but it's even more different when you talk about the team that he was drafted to. The Cleveland Cavaliers went to the Eastern Conference semifinals last year. He is the one player that is new on this team. Every other player on this team was on this roster last season when it comes to the full contracts, obviously, JT Thor, Luke Travers were not two ways on this team last year. Luke Travers was in uh, Australia, and I believe JT Thor was uh, was with the Charlotte Hornets. So it's important to talk about what Jalen Tyson was able to do in tonight's matchup because I want to start here. He has not played in meaningful minutes, really, to start the season, and his first meaningful game, he not only starts, but he plays the most minutes for the Cavs. 
37 minutes. His He said he was tired after the game. He said he was going to do all the recovery that he needed to. And we're going to get into a little bit about how uh, the Cavs are going to utilize this rest that they have, the first uh, set of rest that they really do have uh, to start the season. But Jalen Tyson, right, in those 37 minutes, had 16 points, 11 rebounds, five offensive boards, and seven assists. A near triple-double in his first start of his career. He also was doing it on the defensive end. He had two steals as well. Um, so that also all to be said, he ended the game with one of the best plus minuses, and that can show you what he did impactfully for this team. He had 20 uh, for a plus minus, but... Jalen Tyson is a guy that is extremely confident, right? You look back to what he did at California when he was in his last year in college. He was the man on campus. He was a guy that they turned to to be the point guard, the top scorer, the top defender, all those different things. And the knock on him was, obviously, he wasn't that good of a defender in college, but that was the knock on him coming into the draft. He was a guy that needed to improve his defensive prowess, especially coming to a team that was known originally as a defensive minded team. And then also talking about how he wants to get onto the court. And Jalen came in when he came to his uh, press conference when he was first drafted. It was a lot of talk, right? And it was a lot of questions about how he was going to back it up. And for me to be able to see him, um, play defense to the level that he did. And Ty Jerome mentioned it after the game that he matched up with their best player, right? He matched up with their best player in his first start. And obviously it wasn't their best overall player for the team that they have at the, at New Orleans, but it was their best player of the night. And to see him do that, to say him stand on his word of wanting to be an all defensive team player, that not only showed me, but it'll also show Kenny Atkinson and his staff how much he's willing to put into for the effort to be a player that can be uh, be trusted on both ends of the ball. And when you talk about Jalen Tyson and you talk about what he did in college, it's more about efficiency and how he's going to be able to shoot the ball as well. He hit a three-pointer, which is big for him. He wasn't known as a, a three-point shooter. He was 7-12 to 12 from the field, so that's over 55%, 58.3% to be exact. But that's a guy that you will have to look forward to because he, it feels like entitlement never came to him. He understood the situation he was coming into, all those different things. But he talked about after the game that he wanted to prove to his Cavs teammates that he was a hard worker, that he wanted this as bad as he had said. And so during training camp, before training camp, when Karis LeVert was working his way back from the knee injury that he suffered in the Boston Celtics series that had been lingering um, from the series from before the season had even ended, the one that kept him out in the last game of the season, um, they got to work together, right? Because Jalen Tyson was a guy that wanted to show, like I said, that he was a hard worker and he would go to the gym late at night. He would be in there in, in the wee hours of the morning, as some people may say, and he was getting shots up, getting his work in, but across the court from him on the other hoop was Karis LeVert. Um, and so it wasn't like he wasn't doing it just for himself. He was showing off to his uh, to his teammates and all those different things, but it was the work that he was putting in to get to this point. And I think that's really something that you can value of a player coming into a new system, somebody that's a rookie, somebody that hasn't played meaningful minutes or any of those different things. He's clicked all the different boxes um, appropriately to make his start to the, his career in the NBA, albeit not as meaningful as he might have wanted, something of substance, right? Because you think about other players around the league, right? Uh, we can talk about Dalton Connect. We can talk about um, uh, uh, Jared McCain in, in the 76ers, right? Like those two guys have gotten completely different opportunities because what have their team has called for, right? And they were only a few picks before um, Jalen Tyson. Jalen was the 20th overall pick. Dalton Connect. The 17th, we remember going back to the summer league where they matched up and Jalen Tyson talked about how he wanted to show that those players weren't better than him. And he had talked specifically about the Lakers uh, game. So 
for Dalton Connect to have the game that he did on Tuesday for the Lakers where LeBron was hyping him up and talking about how uh, other teams messed up by not drafting him. And then for Jalen Tyson, not obviously not having the same impact offensively in the scoring department, but being able to impact the entire game because that's what he's known for. It's not just scoring, it's passing, it's rebounding. And rebounding is something that we really want to look forward to for Jalen because of his length, his size, his wing ability. And we know that he was a good rebounder in college. And as Kenny Atkinson has said, that normally translates more than anything else to the NBA. And it's interesting, right, because we talked about the Karis LeVert situation and how um, Jalen Tyson has called him his vet. Like, that is his vet, Karis LeVert, and somebody that has picked – he's picked his brain probably more than anybody else on the team. And for that to be the relationship that they have and Karis LeVert still being able to mentor him when, in theory, Jalen Tyson is competing for Karis LeVert's position – if the Cavs decide to go away from Karras with his expiring contract. It shows not only the maturity level of this team, but understanding that Karras LeVert knows that if this so happens, if he gets injured, if um, other players get injured, Jalen is going to have to be able to step up and play into those different roles to have this Cavs team be able to continue going forward and continue to win ballgames. And if that wasn't the case, maybe Karras doesn't give the same kind of tutelage to Jalen. Maybe he doesn't have the same kind of game. So I think because we talked to these guys before the game, they talked before the game about the maturity aspect and the discipline and the focus that it took to come into a game where both teams have a lot of players out. There might be a, a little bit of a distraction by that, but the maturity level to show and go full out against the team um, and not let off the gas is something that this Cavs team in the past and the last couple of years didn't always do. For them to come back and do this, it shows the maturation of this team, the veteran leadership of this team. And that goes to show what Karis LeVert, Ty Jerome, and all those different guys have done. George Niang as well was in that conversation with Jalen Tyson. That is Jalen Tyson's locker body buddy, George Niang. His locker is right next to his, I believe, to the left of his. And, I mean, George Niang also con- contributed heavily. He had 20 points. <laughs> I believe he had 14 of those in the third quarter. And that was basically wraps, right? You talk about how this team has grown together. Then You talk about what George Niang has done and how he's improved his body this season. He has a plus minus of plus 19. Um, and he was able to impact things defensively as well. He was 6 of 12 from 3. Right. And there's a lot of slander thrown around about George Niang and what he has or hasn't been able to do for this team. So I think that's another important topic to touch on is how these players, these veteran leaders, these guys that have been together for now three years with Donovan Mitchell, George Niang, two years, but also being in the league for a long time, understanding what each moment calls for, each game calls for, because that is how this team has won ballgame taking it a game by game basis rather than looking big picture too much, right? Like you take it game by game, but the big picture is after each win or each loss, Hey, okay, let's have the conversation of where we want to be come April, May, June, because those are when the games are going to matter and how we can get better towards those opportunities towards those days and times. Um, And that's what really this whole, whole thing is about. And To do that, to get to that, I mean, this team is going to continue leaning on Ty Jerome, right? And I briefly touched on what he was able to do. But in the second quarter, right, he had 20 of his 27 points. His career high coming into the game was 24 points. He had 27 points by halftime, right? Like, that is insanity. It's crazy to even think about. It's crazy to uh, just put that into words because of the way that he went about it. And Kenny Atkinson has talked about it before. And he talked about it before today's game. Some of the things that he's doing are surprising to public eye. Even the coaches that have coached with him back when he was in Golden State, Kenny Atkinson said that he is a true point guard. He came in as a pass first guard, and that's what the Cavs have leaned into majority of the time with Donovan and Darius being on the floor with him, probably not at the same time, one or the other, because you like to have a floor setter with Donovan who 
also knows Ty, has known Ty his whole life, right? And for those guys to have that connection, for those guys to understand what each other need in each scenario, each game, each mindset, that's what makes this team great because care like with all those players out, with Darius out, Ty understood. And obviously in a game the other day when he had 20 as well, um, when Donovan was out, he understood that there was a lack of offensive presence with those two either out of the game at the same time or out of the game entirely due to injuries. So he knew that he needed to step up in that capacity. He is a pass for his guard. He's had some great facilitating games to start the season. Today, he just had one, but he ended the game with 29 points. He had 27 in the first half um, and he made seven threes. I had to tell him after the game, I was like, I don't think you understand You not only had your most career high in points, right, but you had a career high in three-pointers made, seven, also done in the first half, and he ended the game with a plus-minus of plus 28, which is a career high, and I believe a game high as well. Yeah, and and the person that was right behind him, Mr. Reliable himself, Jared Allen. Jared Allen had 16 rebounds, or 16 points and 11 rebounds, and he was perfect from the field. Perfect 7-7 from the field and 2 of 2 from the line. So that's exactly what you want from Mr. Reliable, what you want from his foundation. Um, But you also realize that this all came more majority for most of the players in three quarters, right? (laughs) Like, and we talked about it the other day on this podcast, me, Jimmy, and Chris, is how like there are teams that will have players play three quarters and still be at 30 minutes. There was nobody on this team out on, in the starting unit outside of Jalen Tyson that played more than 22 minutes, 24 minutes. I apologize. Um, because Donovan had 19, Ty Jerome had 23, Jer- Jared Allen had 21, Evan Mobley had 18, basically. Like these are guys that have been running ragged to start the season, and they needed the ample rest that they got in the fourth quarter. This is a team that, like I said at the beginning, 17 games in 29 days. That's incredibly long, grueling, and uh, we talked about it with George Niang, the back-to-backs, and then the the three games in four days. All those different things have been weighing on this team. Now that they've made it out of this stretch, Their next 17 games will be played over the course of 43 days, or 40 should they play in the NBA Cup Final. But we talk about how important the Cavs' great start, banking wins, uh, has been to the season because this is one of the toughest stretches that they're going to have this year. Now you talk about the next 17 games over 40 or 40-plus games, you get some more rest. You get time to practice. You get time to take these teams and take these things um, into your film rooms, into your practice facilities, and actually get to workshop them rather than going go, 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 and not having the opportunity um, to take a breather and actually evaluate what you're doing. And I also think, like Kenny Atkinson talked about it before the game, learning from losses, right? Like, we knew the Cavs weren't going to go 82-0. and I'm sorry to anybody that might have thought that, but they still went, they're still 16-1, and right? This is a team that is still contenders. They are proving to everybody that they face that they're no fluke, they're no joke, that they want to continue to build on the habits that they're creating. And sometimes it's better or easier to do that through losses than it is through wins because of all the things that they get to learn in the areas that they might have faltered and how they can improve those, right? We talked even after the Boston Celtics game, the Cavs didn't go to Evan Mobley right in the fourth quarter. He had zero field goal attempts in the fourth quarter. Then you come to tonight's game and Ken, Kenny Atkinson said the first play was drawn up for Evan Mobley. And he said it was his fault, Kenny Atkinson's fault, for not putting the ball into Evan Mobley's hands more. Um, and he said that can't happen if they want to take the next step. And that's something that I wrote about in my column after the Boston Celtics game last night. So I, I think it's important that not only is are the players backing up their words. But Kenny Atkinson and the coaching staff are doing the same thing. They're holding each other accountable on the same level. There is no 
different tiers to responsibility, accountability, none of those different things, because to go together is to go far, right? That's the cliche, the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's what this team is doing with the mindset of trying to get to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time in years and trying to get to the NBA Finals again uh, as well. So, the other player, and I, I know I've talked about and I've ran around a lot of different things, but I want to talk about some of the players that don't usually get um, the hype that they deserve. <laughs> Obviously, talking about players that are two ways or guys that don't get the ample minutes that we've talked about. Jalen Tyson is obviously one of them. He is a storyline. I'm going to write about him for the morning. But the importance of somebody like JT Thor and Tristan Thompson to come into this game with giving Jared Allen and Evan Mobley all the rest that they deserve, right? Because neither of them stepped foot on the court in the fourth quarter. They, Evan Mobley or Jared Allen had zero minutes. <laughs> and, and the Kenny Atkinson and his staff went with this entire same lineup for the entirety of the fourth quarter. It was Jalen Tyson, Craig Porter Jr., Tristan Thompson, JT Thor, and Luke Travers right? JT Thor had all 12 of his points in that fourth quarter. He was four of four. He hit two threes and he grabbed and he stole two balls and had a block. So for a guy, obviously we understand JT Thor wasn't a two-way player to start his career. He was on the Charlotte Hornets. He was getting minutes. He was getting quality minutes at times. He was even starting, right? JT is a guy that is lanky, is cheap and could fall into a category of a backup could the Cavs need to give rest days or all those different things. We talked about uh, when Donovan Mitchell was out for with the rest game um, earlier this week. We talked about how that is a schedule that is set and has been set for the last two months before the season started. J.C. Thor could be in that equation to come in and help out when Evan Mobley or Jared Allen need a break, a break. Um, because we know that Tristan Thompson is an extension of the bench. He is not supposed to get as many minutes as he once did. He's not supposed to be the player that he once was. He's supposed to be the loudmouth, the barker, the, the enforcer, the leadership uh, that he brings not only to on the court, but also in the locker room. He's a calming force, but he's also the realist of every situation. Kenny Atkinson talked uh, uh, again after the game about how Tristan has not only made his job easier and his transition easier, but also is like having real conversations. And I wrote about this earlier into the season about when the Cavs had their best half in basketball, in their uh, team history, I guess the Golden State Warriors, but they came into halftime and their conversation was with Tristan Thompson about how there's concerns about them being complacent or happy with complacency. And that's not what this team is. And that was something that a conversation that has been had more than once in different occasions to allow this team to understand that one game is great. Again, game by game, but if there's a bigger picture, like game by game and wanting to excel at every possibility. And that's one of the things that I took away from today's game is, sure, right? The Cavs had a great second quarter led by Ty Jerome, 20 points in that 40-point quarter. Um, and yet they came out and had an almost as good uh, third quarter, something that has been away from them for a majority of the season. Third quarters have been their Achilles heel, but obviously not to the extent where they've lost, but it has made fourth quarters more manageable, more difficult. Um, you had to go in with more of a plan rather than allowing guys to rest. And that's something that Tristan Thompson has preached earlier into the season. Like if you can rest guys, especially during this grueling stretch that they were on, that's important. And in, in, and in an 82 game season, that's even more so like in their minds, it should be in their minds against teams that they should be blowing out, i.e. the New Orleans Pelicans when eight of their top nine guys are on the bench or not even in Cleveland. So, so for them to have come out and have 36 points in that third quarter, led by George Niang, a veteran who understood the importance of getting those key guys on the bench. Um, and then also, 
we talk about how Jared Allen, Evan Mobley were able to close out that game in the third quarter with their defense. The Cavs held the in the first, I think it was six minutes of the third quarter, they held the New Orleans Pelicans to five points. Last year, we would have called that smothering, right? Or, or suffocating. Suffocates. That's what it was called. Chris would have yelled at me for that one. But it was called suffocates. And that's what uh, Jamie Rickerstaff had implemented. This year, it's just do your job. It's just protect the paint. The Cavs forced the um, forced the New Orleans Pelicans to shoot just five three-pointers. The other, they had 23 attempts in that quarter, in the third quarter. Five of them were three-pointers. So everything else either came at the rim or came in the mid-range. They made just seven shots, right? So you talk about the interior defense of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, who had, I believe it was, 11 points? No. Yeah, they had combined for 11 points, 10 rebounds, two blocks, and, and like it, it was just how intimidating they were on the glass, how intimidating they were um, inside and how that did what it did to the New Orleans Pelicans. They looked like, in, like they just deterred them from going to the basket and getting the shots that they would have wanted to get. And then we talked about the fourth quarter already where how um, their bench players just closed it out with guys getting ample minutes. And I mean, we talk about Tristan Thompson not being a guy that has to be or should be a player that the Cavs count on. He almost had himself with double double, eight and ten, right? And I know this is again against <laughs> a team that was hampered, but I don't think you. Th this is one of those games because of that. I don't think this is one of those games where you can be like, oh, it was garbage time, and <laughs> like this is this is against their B or C team. They started against their B, C, or D team. Whatever you want to describe the New Orleans Pelicans starting lineup, that's not their A team. That's not supposed to be their A team. So you talk about that and talk about what they had on their bench. I believe they didn't even they didn't have a whole bunch of players off their bench anyway. So you talk about all of those different things. You've got to give credit where it's due. You've got to give credit to these guys who are coming off the bench and making impactful things. JT Thor, Tristan Thompson being the two that I wanted to talk about today. Craig Porter Jr. the other night was masterful, right? He was somebody that um, played his role to a T, was able to get to the lane, do all these different things. And it's it's interesting to see his development because, to me, this is more of the season – that we expected Craig Porter to have last year when it comes to minutes and how much he's seen the court and all those different things. But Craig is again, continuing to find his role, continuing to understand who he is for this team. Cause we know he understands what his game is and how he can impact different things. But Craig tonight just finished with four points, but he had seven assists. He had two blocks and two steals. So, again, defense for these guys, for these role players to get onto the court, to get onto the court for the guys that want to get more minutes, want to get more run, want to earn the trust of this coaching staff, this new coaching staff. Defense is where they're going to have to hang their hat. Jalen Tyson is one of them, Craig Porter Jr., JT Thor, right? And they're also going to have to be certain opportunities, right? And this goes back to what we were talking about with what Tristan Thompson has been saying. If the Cavs are able to take advantage against teams that they should be, these guys, these cats should get more opportunities. These role players should get more opportunities to show that they can be trusted. And that creates confidence that not only is good for them now, but is also good for them when it comes to the playoffs, when these situations may happen again. You never want to wish injuries on anybody, but you have to understand that, and we saw it last season, so I know Cavs fans know it, the Cavs and every other team in the NBA are dealing with things after an 82-game season going into the playoffs. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect or ideal or all these different things. So you have to be prepared for the worst. And to do that, you have to have everybody on your roster ready to go rather than prioritizing their top five, top eight guys, that leaves for confidence lists to go through the role players that could get opportunities. And that's why Kenny Atkinson's system of 10, 11 guys, which will 
more than likely grow to 12 once Max Drews gets here or gets back from his injury could change the dynamic and has changed the dynamic of this team to start the season. They don't get to 16 and one without most of these players, without the confidence that these players are shooting with. Right. George Niang, we talked about what he said about how he wouldn't have done some of the different the different things. Kenny Atkinson talked before the game about how in the Boston game, even though I understand and people are going to listen to this and think I'm crazy. But Darius Garland talked to Kenny Atkinson after the game and Kenny said that he was happy that uh, Darius took the amount of shots that he did against Boston, those 21 shots, which is just the second most of the season for him, even though he was just three of 21 from the field, because that shows that you didn't lose confidence. You didn't have uh, anything weigh on you. You were still knowing that you had the green light. Darius responded to that text message saying, yeah, I wouldn't have done that last year, something to the likes of that. So I think it's important that we continue to understand how Kenny Atkinson is at his incorporating these guys, empowering these guys, and helping them get to the next level and achieve their full potential. Because if this is like the third or fourth guy that says, yeah, I wouldn't have done that last year, or I wouldn't have been able to do that last year, that is what we've been saying since um, the offseason. The players are going to tell you about what they liked and what they didn't like about the former coach. And it's been a lot of the same story. So, I wanted to end the podcast like this and go through the Eastern Conference especially, but look at where teams are. Because as we talked about, the Cavs are banking wins and being able to continue to grow. They are the number one seed in the East, as I've said, continuously. Boston Celtics, 12-3. and three. They're in the second seed. Orlando Magic, they're 9-6 and six and tied with the New York Knicks for the third seed, um, who are in 9-6 and six as well. Miami's in the five seed. They are have they have a record of six and seven. Every other team in the in, in the Eastern Conference, Miami included, have a losing record outside of the top four teams in the East. Right then you turn to the Western Conference. They got the top two teams as the Golden State Warriors in the Oklahoma City Thunder, um, eleven and three and twelve and four. The Los Angeles Lakers are in the third seed, ten and four. And then you got the Houston Rockets at 11 and five in the four seed. Um, and then it gets tricky throughout the rest, right? But going back to the Eastern Conference to wrap this up, the teams that I believe the Cavs need to continue to watch, continue to uh, monitor when it comes to wins, when it comes to how they're playing, how they're operating, are the top four teams. Boston, not including themselves, so the t- three teams after. Boston, Orlando, New York. And I've said this from the beginning of the season. I've said this um, to start the year, all those different things. Orlando being the third seed, even without Paolo Bancaro, even with him potentially coming back um, by Christmas, which is what he said in a recent interview after a torn oblique, them winning the amount of games, I believe they're on a six game winning streak. So you have to monitor them. Obviously, the New York Knicks, just because of how they play against the Cavs, but also how this team continues to grow and learn about itself um, during a season where they add in new pieces, are without a true big, have Carl Anthony Towns playing the five, and are a five-out lineup that could uh, deter the Cavs, which is different from what the Cavs are used to when it comes to playing the Knicks, who are a physical team, a burly team, a team that goes after everybody. But they're also on a four-game win streak, um, and the <laughs> the Celtics are also on a three-game winning streak. So those are the teams that I would monitor or keep up with, but tomorrow's episode is going to be a Hey Chris episode, so you're going to want to send in your questions. But to do that, you're going to have to sign up for Subtech. With that being said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs Insider and interact with Chris, me, and Jimmy by subscribing to Subtext. One or both of the guys may join me on tomorrow's episode of Hey Chris. So sign up for a 14-day free trial to send in your questions and give your thoughts about this team going into its 18th game of the season. So you can also do this by visiting cleveland.com backslash Cavs and clicking on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy. But we can tell you that the people who sign up 
stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me, Chris, and Jimmy. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.